Hello everyone, welcome to the day 2 of Ecom. Yesterday we discussed how Krama is enabling the next emerging digital society. And today we will be talking more about how it has been practically implemented by Moi. We will be in today's session, we will be discussing uh, how the concept of Moi evolved around Krama. And we have Ganesh with us from the Moi team. He has extensive uh, experience in being contributor to multiple Web2 and Web3 technologies and he is an author as well. So I would like to introduce Ganesh uh, to start our day two agenda, which is in-depth analysis of technology and engineering. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, Gitika. Uh, happy to be here and uh, talk about uh, Moi and uh, share the story about how Moi evolved uh, around Krama and uh, implementing some of the core concepts there. So, um, let me go on to my slides. So, as many uh, many of you have uh, already uh, joined uh, yesterday's talk uh, keynote session provided by AK, uh, AK spoke about uh, some major important things and uh, he uh, enlightened us about uh, some of the fundamental aspects of the research we have made. Uh, the primordial one of them being that uh, the user control over uh, their own digital interactions will uh, increase the happiness quotient. Uh, the overarching goal being that uh, everybody deserves to be happy in their uh, real physical life and they deserve to be happy in their digital life too. And uh, to enable that and to make that happen, uh, we are looking for a new context aware intelligent machinery that is needed to implement human-like digital interactions the way we interact in uh, day-to-day life similar to that but in the metaverse as well and uh, to uh, implement this design of a context-aware intelligent machinery uh, what we need is a intelligent machine uh, which is basically context-aware uh, and uh, uh, enable participant-centric ordering and agreement. And uh, that is exactly what uh, Ananda spoke to you all about, uh, which is basically uh, Krama. So uh, Krama is the context-aware compute, right? Uh, which is uh, uh, driving this whole paradigm shift. And uh, Krish machine, uh, what we would like to call as Krish machine is the context-aware intelligent machine, which is implementing Krama. Um, so with that uh, uh, highlights and uh, a quick recap of uh, what we spoke yesterday, uh, let's move on to the end point of uh, what uh, AK discussed um, uh, yesterday with all of us, which was the interaction state machine. So interaction state machine is the practical way of implementing a crush machine and uh, Moi is the, one of the first implementations of the uh, interaction state machine. So essentially, uh, it's a context aware peer to peer protocol uh, implementing and uh, implementing and borrowing the ideas of interaction state machine to enable a human like digital interactions in a uh, emerging digital world. So uh, before I uh, go about introducing Moi, uh, let us first understand how uh, we have been searching for harmony in the digital world. So we had the um, invention of the internet and it was uh, used well um, to organize our, ourselves digitally. And uh, that's what some of us have uh, heard as Web2 today, which is basically a location addressed information um, management, uh, which is basically permission uh, users uh, will be able to uh, get their identity from an agent where the security is very nominal uh, and availability is guaranteed 
uh, by the service companies and uh, confidentiality will only have to be assumed you just don't know whether your information is actually confidential or not some of the best examples uh, for uh, this particular concern that i am bringing up is uh, cambridge analytica and a bunch of uh, other um, uh, real life uh, hacks and uh, leaks that uh, we have observed so far in the industry uh, apart from that there is also a question on the integrity of uh, the data and the uh, nature of operations Uh, that these providers uh, typically provide so there is just no way to verify what whether they are claiming is actually uh, true or not so web2 in general has helped us take a first few steps in the uh, general evolution of the internet uh, but it definitely has uh, a long way to go and uh, uh, most of the product uh, folks who have joined this call would uh, probably understand this uh, uh, from their prism which is that of a cia triad right so uh, you focus uh, uh, either on availability integrity or uh, confidentiality and try to solve for the maximum out of it so that is the general prism that uh, we have demonstrated here where we know that sometimes availability is high but confidentiality uh, is uh, supposed to be assumed and integrity is also supposed to be assumed Uh, or it could be the other way around where uh, the ball keeps passing in the CIA triad. Uh, to fix some of the issues that we have been facing in Web two, um, a group of people came up with uh, uh, ideas to basically break these uh, walled gardens uh, since the mid nineteen nineties and uh, using primarily cryptography um, and distributed systems. theories to solve these problems and disintermediate some of the agents and and that's what we hear today as web3 uh that's a new name given to an old technology is how i how i would like to see it uh it's a uh, basically a location it 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 assumes some of the technologies from web2 it it derives some of the technologies from web2 it's mostly location and content addressed uh, uh but the the most important value that uh, web3 has contributed uh, is actually the ability to democratize entry into our system so uh, with uh, some of these uh, uh, web3 projects or uh, blockchain protocols uh, people can just uh, host a node and uh, just be part of the system and have the same ability uh, to make decisions as uh, others um uh that's at least the claim of most of these blockchain protocols um but at the same time you know uh, when it comes to the questions uh, or the uh, prism views such as uh, the availability and uh, confidentiality and security right uh, availability uh, if it is uh, tried to be made highly available it ends up either becoming a centralized server even in the case of web3 or at best distributed not more than that uh whereas when it comes to confidentiality uh some of the earliest web3 uh, uh projects uh, and blockchains uh, did not use encryption uh but the recent innovations uh, uh, uh in the space has encryption of the transaction data as well so uh integrity uh, is also uh, strongly present because of uh, the decentralization factor where a bunch of validators from different uh geographies in the world can come together and host a network and uh, make sure that it's open enough for others as well to join and to make the best use of the services offered by the network so that's a great thing about uh web3 uh as a beginning of a revolution but um unfortunately it also suffers from its own success so that's a uh, uh, well formulated uh, by a group of researchers uh, who are in the early stage of the evolution and uh, that's uh, today famously known as the blockchain trilemma so blockchain trilemma focuses on solving uh, for two problems out of three which is uh, either to achieve decentralization uh, to a very broad extent uh or uh, to achieve scalability uh by uh, having the ability to host as many number of nodes and also use them to process as many transactions as possible uh and uh, also make this secure uh in terms of uh, 
uh, correctness uh, and uh, liveness of the user state or data that is being managed in the network. So uh, that's a very interesting uh, way of looking at the status of the Web3 space. Um, having said all of this, uh, what's really nice uh, to um, uh, talk about uh, here at this stage uh, with all of you is that uh, we've been observing this space for a while, right? Uh, and when we try to build applications, real life applications for enterprises as well as uh, uh, retail use cases, what we have learned is that permission is okay uh, to a certain extent, but then it takes away control. Democratization in Web3, on the other hand, gives you control, but it might actually limit our exposure to certain services uh, in terms of availability. And uh, we might just not be able to actually make the best use of the resources in the network. So in such scenarios, what we have found out uh, to be really helpful is uh, uh, Krama's uh, concepts of individualization or personalization. So uh, by making uh, the best of the both worlds, but then also keeping it unique to own digital selves is what I think is the future of the web. And that's exactly what uh, we can do with the help of Krama. So Krama, with the help of Krama, we've been able to establish a context address paradigm on the web, uh, which keeps users' data, users' identity, and users' assets in a more personalized and individualized uh, path. And uh, whereas when it comes to Web2 and Web3, where security is uh, not very clear uh, at scale, in, in the case of uh, Krama, and under the paradigm of Krama, uh, security actually increases at scale. Uh, we'll talk more about how exactly this works or uh, why exactly we are able to make this claim. Uh, and when it comes to availability, uh, although we are quite aware of the kind of uh, availability we have under the Web2 paradigm, uh, Web3's availability has been suffering for a while and uh, that's an open tool. Uh, but uh, under the Kramas paradigm, uh, we've been able to actually guarantee the liveness aspect, right? Uh, guarantee uh, availability by not limiting the concept of availability just to resources alone, but to actually add context or the global digital footprint of the user itself as one of the critical resources of availability. So that's a revelation of its own. And we will learn more about that in the coming slides. Uh, and whereas uh, when it comes to confidentiality in uh, Web2, uh, although you can trust them that the data is encrypted, you cannot actually verify, not most of the times, not by uh, uh, simple users uh, in most of the use cases. We just mostly trust them. Uh, whereas in Web3, confidentiality related uh, efforts uh, led by uh, you know cryptographic tools and technologies primarily are mostly uh, verifiable as long as you are open to it uh, but at the same time it's not uh, more often given to you as a choice but it's actually by default uh, a particular algorithm or a particular approach of the town or the group of developers who take that decision and you just have to go with it uh, whereas uh, under the Kramas paradigm uh, shift and uh, the uh, concepts that it offers, uh, Moi has a great benefit of actually uh, using the concept of personal personalization, or rather, you know, uh, extend that uh, concept uh, all the way to even confidentiality and let the user decide how they want to share information in what specific way and to whom exactly. So that's a complete different spin and uh, different take on how we can put the user at the control and not the other way around. Um, and, and finally, when it comes to integrity of services, uh, we know, uh, again, when we compare with Web2 and Web3, that most of them are either centralized or at best distributed. Uh, but with Krama, the ability to uh, take care of your state, your data, your uh, uh, identity, and your assets are a lot more uh, safer uh, thanks to the entropy that is uh, used uh, in the uh, uh, leveraging network's own entropy and use it uh, and help the 
uh, users um, secure their uh, state and their footprint. So all of that put together really helps us understand where we are in the, I, I always like to call this as the grand scale of evolution. So I think uh, Web2 has seen its days and it has helped us actually have this call that we are in on Zoom right now. But at the same time, Web3 uh, is yet to uh, see a lot more paradigm shifts uh, under its curve. And uh, uh, we are really happy to uh, be here and uh, uh, enjoy all the nuances as well as the benefits that it has offered and uh, make the best out of it in the future. So what is the future? Uh, the future is my. The future is my own internet. So it's a future where uh, each user's journey uh, in the internet is more personalized, uh, more participant centric and uh, very much context aware. Um, and why I say this is because it's a protocol which uh, leverages these fundamental concepts, uh, starting with the ability to first create your own independent self-sovereign identity and uh, use those uh, identities and attach them uh, natively uh, to your wallet and uh, you know with, with the power of ZKP that uh, uh, Moy offers you have the ability to identify your true digital self just like in real life the way you authenticate yourself with probably a voter's ID or a DL's license DL, uh, uh, a driver's license uh, having some similar abilities uh, to really truly identify yourself uh, uh, on the digital world is uh, I think going to be very powerful in the future and to do it in a very secure way respecting your privacy and making sure that that data is not used by applications uh, in a uh, you know uh, crazy or random way or even for that matter by just the protocol itself is something that uh, 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 tools and technologies uh, based on zero knowledge proofs can provide and uh, that's actually one of the best thing about Moi. Uh, it's a personalized protocol which allows you to uh, create your true digital self uh, with the help of uh, ZKPs and uh, Web44 wallets and uh, self-sovereign identities. But it's not just about identities alone, it's about what you do with your digital identity and most of the times we just use the internet to consume information or to produce information. So we just today have no idea where that data or uh, information is stored. Uh, where is it being replicated? How is it being replicated? And all these questions are still unanswered to most of us. So that's the, that's the second fold uh, uh, of the protocol where the protocol allows you to use your identity and attach the information and decide where you want to store your data. It could be the pics that you upload to Instagram, it could be essays that you're writing on, a, on, a, on, on your own blog, whatever it is, uh, the same information can be stored on Moi as well. Uh, and you get to, this time, you get to decide where your data is stored uh, by offering you complete location transparency so that you can be sure that this IP, a machine of this IP actually holds my data. And these are the other machines with a replica of my data and it's replicated n number of times. I think that is the kind of sophistication that uh, the future of the web will need uh, for a well uh, acquainted user of the internet and uh, that's exactly what, what Moi provides uh, to uh, users. A sophisticated bunch of choices to decide uh, how to manage their data. Um, but most important of all of them is that while you have an identity and while you actually uh, create or produce information, you are also creating values. Uh, Ananta has already spent quite some time yesterday uh, explaining to us about uh, the value space and uh, how it's currently limited and what kind of uh, uh, white spaces can be unlocked with a paradigm shift in uh, in, in this space uh, with the help of Krama, right? So with, with the help of Krama, we have the ability to allow users to define their own values. But not only that, we can even 
use moi to personalize the way we use these values and customize however we want the values or assets to be transferred from one person to another this sophistication is again the third fold of the protocol uh, which is very exciting and uh, looking forward in time uh, to actually serve the real use cases that the internet is yet to see so that's the personalization aspects uh, uh, in in krama that moi is covering but how is how, how is how is this all enabled is the six is the next question that you would be interested in right so this is all enabled by again the participant centric concepts of uh, krama so essentially the first thing that we need to realize is that every user on the internet they leave a digital footprint of their own we would like to call that as context uh, in moi protocol scope uh, context is a is a uh, is a paradigm shift in thinking about how you can actually leverage that situation and uh, information related to that particular situation and then use that also as a resource to solve real world problems so it's uh, to explain it to a uh, in a eli fine manner uh, i would like to explain context as a think of it like a network level social graph where instead of uh, akin to a social media social graph where you are a user and you have a bunch of other users as followers uh, and all of them get a notification when you tweet akin to that but it's a network level social graph where uh, there is an account and the followers are basically nodes uh, who basically uh, get a notification every time there's a new sign transaction from your account or you receive you have a, a sign transaction from another user and you are on the receiving end uh that's uh, a eli5 version of context uh, uh, for people who want to just begin understanding context uh so with that kind of a network level social graph context uh you can have a bunch of nodes following a particular wallet or an account and then every time a new transaction is related to that particular account um all those nodes uh with a bunch of other random nodes we'll speak about that very soon a bunch of nodes will come together and uh, quickly try to um, address that transaction and uh, decide whether it's valid or not and uh, add them to your local chain so uh, how do we make sure that this is collision resistant uh, instead of uh, associating all the nodes in the network to the protocol uh, we have only a set of nodes that are part of your context your account context and the counterparty's account context come together and then match more number of nodes than these number of nodes uh, and and those are obviously going to be random uh, and put all these people together and ask them to collaborate and achieve a consensus on the transaction thereby making this whole effort collusion resistant uh so that's the key enabler for the three folds that we just uh, spoke of before uh so these participant centric uh, uh uh concepts really help us achieve the uh, personalization goals uh and enable users uh, uh to uh you know have their own blockchain create their own identities manage their own data uh, to the deepest way possible and then of course define their own values and customize uh the way they can actually share their values uh of course uh first uh, and, and then um uh, finally uh, coming to the uh last part how how are we going to see moi in action where, is, where how how do we use moi where is it going to be used right so moi as a protocol will be implemented right so it's going to be the world's first context aware peer to peer network um uh, and it's a visionary reference implementation that's being built right now where we are we are aiming for anywhere between uh 200000 nodes to 500000 nodes uh in the network uh and and these nodes are going to be intelligently managed by the network uh and uh route them to the necessary transactions 
uh, and ask them to settle the transactions in a collision resistant manner, thereby offering us uh, higher throughput by effective utilization of resources in the network. Uh, so this way you are able to transact, uh, billions of users will be able to transact across uh, millions of nodes in a very easy way. And, and, and that's the goal of uh, using my protocol to establish the world's first context of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, but it should not again end up becoming a silo like most of the other Web3 projects. So when it comes to that, the protocol has always been uh, Web2 aware and Web3 aware in general. Um, so when it comes to that, we have interoperability features as well as uh, part of my that uh, you will learn more in the coming sessions. Uh, but if I have to summarize what is a my protocol, it's uh, basically a uh, context aware peer-to-peer -peer protocol which offers each users their own chain and allows users to define and manage their own identity data and values uh, or for a lack of a better word assets so that's what moi is um, uh, so to quickly summarize how we can define this uh, how we can define it as a technology uh, coming from a tech, a deep tech startup, uh, uh, you know, it's a combination of uh, fundamental changes to the data structures and, uh, uh, you know, methods that are used in uh, state management uh, in, a, in a distributed system. Uh, but at the same time, it's also about foundationally thinking about it differently by introducing a new ordering scheme, which is based on the user's own context. and then implementing a new consensus algorithm um, uh, on, on top of this uh, that allows users to personalize the, their uh, uh, identity, data, assets, and many other things in the network. So put together, here we have a, a technology more than just a protocol. Uh, it's a technology uh, that personalizes networks So I'm sure that uh, uh, most of you have heard about Ananta, talking about the trickling down um, the concepts on the way to an interaction state machine as, as uh, one of the uh, ways uh, to implement the digital order. So when it comes to that, the prism of Moi uh, being one of the implementation of interaction state machine will look like this. So these are the fundamental building blocks or the components of my protocol uh, where uh, you see that uh, Dhruva, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, database, uh, uh, you know, being powered by Agora, which is basically a data exchange layer uh, based on user's context, uh, will work closely uh, with uh, data structures that are defined by the protocol, which is basically Tesseract, uh, which you will hear more about from my colleagues again, uh, right after this call, uh, attached uh, to uh, encoding mechanisms uh, that make uh, information sharing a little bit more efficient. So it's not just about just innovation all along, it also has been a journey of optimization. And that's what you're seeing here in this uh, uh, particular slide. Uh, uh, Paired with uh, Krama's own uh, uh, ability to order information with the help of a virtualized uh, PVFP mechanism uh, that allows, uh, that, that leverages the randomness in the network uh, and allows a bunch of nodes to uh, come together and uh, arrive at uh, the consensus for a given transaction put together with the help of the POXT uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, where the randomness uh, is uh, provided by Flux and uh, making sure that in this whole process uh, there's no, you know, civil resistance, uh, civil attacks must be resisted so for that we are senators and of course we need to make sure that uh, the whole thing comes together and the whole, uh, the whole operation comes together in a cluster and uh, uh, the achieve consensus for which we have the consensus mechanism called POXT. Well, you'll hear more about each one of them in the coming sessions by uh, other colleagues as well. Uh, uh, all, all of this uh, slapped together with uh, our developer environment uh, 
which introduces a new language and an execution environment uh, is, is exactly what Moi is about uh, with, with client access as well. Uh, that's just a technical slice and diced view of the protocol. Um, now, how do you see it from an external view, right? How does this actually look to an external world uh, uh, which is operating at business or technical level? So currently the Moi ecosystem is uh, a network of more than 500 nodes operated by more than 70 businesses and uh, individuals across the globe. Um, and, and these people and organizations, they have put together more than 500 nodes uh, to create a network we call as the MoiNet. And, uh, on, uh, and, and that's the network layer. And uh, using the middlewares uh, uh, for identity and data management and assets that we call today as uh, uh, Moi ID, Moi Bed, and Moi Verse gives you the ability as an application developer to help your users uh, use the network to define and control uh, and essentially own uh, their identity data and assets. And that's exactly what you see uh, apps like Finovers, Finance, Transact Block, Aurum, and uh, a couple of other applications doing on the Moico system right now. And uh, parallel to this, when it comes to the other aspects of the Web2 reality that I spoke to you about earlier, we also have uh, a private implementation of Moi that can be spun off by uh, organizations uh, using uh, a different enterprise implementation of Moi, uh, which will create uh, Moizen. Uh, I can, uh, so unlike uh, Ethereum's private implementations that are available out there, these implementations will be able to optionally turn on the ability to commit or bridge information uh, from the public MOI, which is the MOI net as well, uh, in the future, if they need it. If they don't need it, it can just still survive and work as a distributed silo application in their own enterprise firewall as well. Uh, that's a very quick summary of the Moi ecosystem from a functional side of things. But when it comes to the technical side of the Moi ecosystem, you have a bunch of modules which are powering this. And uh, you can again see some of the names that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, look up here again. So uh, that's the quick overview or uh, sneak peek at the Moi ecosystem. Now, all of this is great, but we really have to understand how this works for an end user at the end of the day. Uh, so how does Moi help an actual end user on a day-to-day -day scenario? Uh, let's take a quick example of uh, Alice. Uh, Alice is an, is, a, is an individual and uh, uh, she is supposed to interact uh, with a, a company called Bob and uh, a person called Carlos. So. Um, Alice has to pay $10 to Bob in exchange for a cup of coffee uh, and let's also assume that Alice must pay a million dollars in suitable currency uh, to Carlos uh, in exchange uh, Alice gets a villa in a particular geography. Uh, in, in this particular example, uh, traditional blockchains uh, typically have a competitive open market where Alice is uh, supposed to pay up just about the same price uh, for both the transactions to get them settled as per the network's median time to settle or to have, have them settled at the median time of finality. What is fundamentally wrong about this is that for a $10 transaction, she pays just about the same amount as a million dollar transaction. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that a $10 coffee transaction should not take as much time as that of a million dollar transaction. So essentially, what I'm trying to say here is that blockchains or Web2 systems also for that matter, Web2 payment systems or networks for that matter, don't have the ability to customize the UX of certain transactions, commercial nature as it may be, uh, to tailor to the uh, emotional 
uh, or security requirements of a particular user i wouldn't want to wait for a bitcoin uh, transaction uh, or a lightning network transaction uh, to be settled uh, uh, while i wait for a cup of coffee uh, but i i might be interested in actually waiting for a couple of days uh, uh, to make sure that the title transfer from uh, carlos happens thoroughly uh, in a verifiable manner but this ux uh, uh, variations are just not currently possible today uh, in the real world and alice is suffering from that problem so in a to be scenario in in case of moi uh, alice can join moi today she can create a wallet and she can have her own blockchain with the help of moi and so can bob and carlos and whenever alice wants a cup of coffee alice will transfer 10 dollars to bob thereby invoking a new transaction and when that transaction is settled bob will in exchange transfer the coffee but unlike other blockchains uh, in this case the transaction is being managed uh, selectively by a group of nodes that belong to alice's context and bob's context and these nodes from both groups are further accompanied by a bunch of random nodes that are offered by the protocol just to make sure that there are no collusion uh, created by either of the parties. Along with that, we have some observer nodes um, as well. And you can see them in the legend that the green nodes are the nodes from Alice's context, red nodes are from Bob's context, and green nodes are basically from the protocol, the random nodes are chosen by the protocol by leveraging the network's entropy. And then the black uh, dots are basically observer nodes uh, whose uh, primary goal is to just uh, observe and capture proofs of any faults or uh, coercion or collusion and then submit it for further steps such as slashing or other different types of penalizations. So Alice's transaction will now quickly get settled because unlike Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other Web2 or Web3 systems, the entire network's resources are not attending this particular transaction. It's a micro transaction and those transactions are getting settled in Alice's and Bob's chain. So what matters the most is that the nodes that are related to Alice are present and the nodes related to Bob is present. And they get together and decide whether this transaction is valid or not with the help of some random nodes as well. So Alice and Bob will be able to settle this transaction very quickly and uh, move on with their life. Now let's talk about Alice and Carlos. Alice wants to now transfer a million dollars to Carlos. Um, but she definitely wants to be sure about this and she probably wants more of the world, uh, if not the most, to know about this particular transaction. So Alice has this ability to basically set a trust quotient where she enhances the size of the cluster which is involved in deciding the transaction. And that in uh, Alice's case is basically shown in the ICS2 box which is basically having more nodes compared to the number of nodes in the first cluster, the ICS1 box. So here you can see that more nodes are involved uh, from both Alice's context as well as uh, Carlos's context but proportionally the network and the protocol basically is offering as many random nodes uh, as possible proportionally uh, as well uh, thereby again preventing any forms of collusion. So this way Alice and Carlos can work uh, in a more diligent manner and get that $1 million transaction settled and uh, have the title transfer made in a more diligent manner. In this case, uh, you can see that Alice's transaction with Bob generated a Tesseract TA1 in Alice's chain, the green chain. Uh, at the same time, it also created a similar copy in Bob's chain as well. And that you can see as TB1, that's Tesseract. Similarly, in the Alice to Carlos context as well, you can see a Tesseract, TA2, a second Tesseract has been appended 
to Alice's chain and Carlos has a new Tesseract TC1 appended to his chain. This way, Moi can actually enable personalized value definitions as well as personalized value transfers by leveraging context of every participant and essentially just effectively use or intelligently use the resources of the network instead of boiling the entire ocean like other primitive blockchains or web systems also for that matter. So this is exactly what uh, we are able to achieve with the help of uh, Grama and Tesseract. But that's just one simple example uh, that we just saw with uh, a more magnified uh, uh, angle. But uh, just to give a highlight, there can be other use cases as well. So you don't have to, with, with help of more, you don't have to trade uh, between um, other counterparties with a centralized uh, unit of currency like USDT or uh, any other stable coin also for that matter. In this case, you can see that uh, Alice and Bob used to previously trade using USDT, uh, whereas now Alice and Bob can trade with the help of TDU, Total Digital Utility offered by Moi. Uh, they can personalize their own values as well, and they can just eliminate the need for a centralized digital currency or a centralized value for that matter, and then just use their own personal values to trade. That's a fantastic use case, which is just unexplored in the entire history of internet. Very few use cases and a lot more to come in the future. Now, that's just one use case. The second use case is the ability to uh, exactly dictate where your data should go. This is a great use case for privacy, respecting uh, law uh, uh, laws being implemented in jurisdictions such as the Europe with uh, something like GDPR, where uh, applications or develop, uh, application developers or application end users for that matter can actually use Moi and, and uh, Moi's uh, uh, technologies and related storage services and softwares to decide what kind of data can sit where and how many times it can be replicated exactly. And in this particular example, we can see that Alice wants to store her vacation photos in Bob's machine, but her professional modeling photos will go in Carlos's machine. Not only that, but Alice wants to replicate her vacation photos three times, but she wants to manage her professional modeling photos and replicate them even safer. And she thereby she wants to replicate them like 10 times across a group of nodes. So this is able this 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 kind of customization is happening because of users context and that's the great use case uh, those are the kind of great uses use cases that we can deliver with the help of my finally uh, the one of the real life scenarios uh, that i have come across is that if i have to gift some of my friends uh, some sort of a return gift let's say uh, for attending my party I usually have to ask them a couple of wallets and add them or whitelist them in my particular wallet as well and then initiate the transfer and which makes me have those wallets as well because I also have to operate in those particular group of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so that's a very uh, tricky position where we are in uh, right now uh, where we need to have multiple different wallets for different blockchains and uh, send the cryptocurrencies uh, to those particular wallets. Whereas uh, imagine uh, imagine a future where you can have one wallet software uh, providing you the options to basically create uh, these uh, wallets and just you just need their user ID instead of a wallet, uh, which helps you transfer wallets, uh, transfer tokens to those respective wallets of their own chain. Uh, that's a very great interoperability uh, use cases for people interacting with each other but wants to transfer values from heterogeneous ecosystems, uh, which is basically Ethereum, Bitcoin, Atom, Polkadot, um, or Moi for that matter in the future, uh, all these ecosystems. But those are just, you know, some basic use cases. The future is, you know, going to be built by people who are going to think beyond all these use cases and come up with, uh, solve problems uh, uh, and come up with some really new ideas. Um, 
but how do we compare now with the capabilities that i showed you uh, with uh, some of the real life protocols um, so bitcoin and ethereum um, primarily focus on peer to peer transactions of value and a more programmatic trans, uh, transfers of value whereas we are focusing more on personalized transfer of values um, both bitcoin and ethereum borrow the concept of uh, blockchain which is basically a monolithic linked list of uh, a uh, snapshot of uh, user data whereas with moi uh, there's no monolithic blockchain each user gets their own blockchain every user gets their own blockchain and uh, these blockchains are intelligently managed by network in a collusion resistant and civil resistant manner um, and while proof of work and proof of stakes have been the civil resistance mechanism uh, for uh, the bitcoin and ethereum network a uh, moist civil resistant uh, mechanism is uh, to use also use context as one of the uh, primary resources along with the other means so quickly summarize uh, we are a bunch of passionate people who are working uh, on the vision to allow users to um, personalize uh, and get control of their get hold of their identity storage and uh, assets so i think uh, we really like what we are doing and i think uh, this will be uh, one of the earliest protocols uh, in the personalized space that is about to be established for the coming decades and uh, we are happy here uh, happy to be here uh, learn from the best uh, as well as the worst of uh, these uh, previous technologies and protocols and uh, uh health users uh become more happier in their digital life um uh, with that uh i'll open up for questions so if you have any thank you so much ganesh for this interactive session and explaining the concept of moi uh, so well now we have rahul with us he will be talking about consensus and value recognition so rahul over to you yeah Yeah. Uh, hi guys. Uh, I'm Rahul, a core protocol developer at Moi. Uh, today I'm here to um, talk about consensus and value recognition in Moi protocol. Okay. Uh, let me just reiterate uh, what Ganesh has explained and fundamentally understand what is the foundational issue um, and Web three and why does Web three lack mainstream adoption? All right. Uh, uh, let us take two real world use cases. One, a uh, like. a uh, 5 dollar uh, coffee purchase transaction and a um, million dollar house sale transactions these transactions are absolutely um, different uh, their trust requirements are different their value uh, economical value is different their use cases are absolutely different um if you if you'd like to do uh, um, interact on the current web3 infrastructure or current web3 technologies you want to perform these both use cases most of the web3 protocols available out there treat these uh, both interactions in exact similar fashion right and uh, though the trust requirements are different though the value associated with this particular interactions are different they are absolutely treated them similar right on the flip side let us take how human interactions work today all human interactions are driven by context right uh for example this conversation that i'm having with you guys have some context associated with it and next minute after the session the conversation that i have with my colleague will have a different context context so this context associated with human interactions is what which makes them more efficient secure and highly scalable right whereas coming back to the way that we uh, approach uh, transactions on web3 uh, these are not context aware and that is what which makes it uh, which which is creating all sort of problems in terms of scalability privacy security and uh, yada yada right so there are there are solutions there are solutions that uh, the all the new age protocols are trying to solve this problem they fundamentally understood that uh, gen building a general purpose fat protocol and assuming that it would solve uh, it would it would solve all the business needs is absolutely not a reality right so a general purpose fat protocol building uh, building all uh, all sort of business use cases on a general purpose uh, uh, protocol is nowhere a reality and that that has a lot of limitations right so um 
the new age protocols are trying to approach this problem, but still their approach is very systemic in nature. What I mean by that is basically now rather than building a general purpose protocol, you are trying to build application specific protocols, right? Uh, or we are trying to build L2 solutions, which would which would decrease the problem size rather than having a 10,000 node network, we are trying to have uh, like 100 node network, a 20 node network and 30 node network, but still the problem is not yet solved, right? And the problem still exists because when you want to facilitate uh, the communication between two shards or the two applications running on a different network, it's it's very complicated and it's a time consuming process, right? And that's where your bridging comes into picture. So this is still not efficient and this is not gonna uh, so when the l2 sizes goes up again you need to come up with something called l3 l4 l5 and something like it goes on right so what we fundamentally feel right so the current web3 solutions or the technologies available there are mostly general purpose or if they are very application specific uh, and the entry barrier to this technology is very high. For example, if you want to be part of uh, Ethereum validator today, you need to stay around 32 Ethers or uh, Bitcoin for that matter, you need to have high computation power, right? And which is not which is not easily available for most of the people. So it's not as easy as you get on internet today, right? So you need a special purpose hardware or you need special, special economical value to be part of these networks or to be, to be a validator in these networks. So on the on the on the, on, on the flip side, what we are trying to do is basically uh, we require a protocol, we require a technology where we require a protocol or a technology which will support human-like digital interactions. Uh, and so, uh, what we're trying to do is basically, if we were to support human-like digital interactions, right? And if humans are going to interact more on the digital space, we need protocols or technologies which faci exactly facilitate human-like digital interactions. What I mean by that is basically we need to, uh, the protocols need to understand the context associated with these interactions and uh, basically allow users to personalize the requirement, personalize the requirements uh, uh, for every interaction, right? So for a coffee purchase transaction, the trust requirements are very minimal. You need not to achieve consensus on a bigger set of nodes. Whereas for a house sale transaction, the trust requirements are very high. You need to achieve consensus on a bigger set of nodes, right? So uh, keeping that in mind, so uh, we feel like, like the way to go about it is to have a context aware uh, protocol which supports human like digital interactions. And, and how do we do it? Basically, uh, as introduced by Ananta and Ganesh in the previous sessions, we have Krama. Krama is the uh, context-aware uh, computation uh, model which supports human-like digital interactions in a participant-centric uh, and promote and supports participant-centric networks. And yeah, and coming back, so today I'm here to uh, explain a practical implementation of Krama and how exactly this is being done and developed at Server Labs. So PYXT uh, is a context-aware uh, deterministic SMR approach which enables human-like digital interactions in open networks by implementing an interaction state machine and a participant-centric ordering and replication mechanism. So it's uh, just to cut it short, it's an SMR approach which supports human-like digital interactions uh, and uh, on an interaction state machine, uh, but it also supports a participant-centric ordering and replication mechanism. So let's understand what exactly is an interaction state machine and how it is different from a regular state machine. So an interaction state machine is a computation model where the state transition happens on the participants' con participant centric states. It's not there's nothing called global states. It's only participant centric states. So and the state transition functions or the compute logic that you execute are very interaction specific. They are not like a general purpose computation logic. There are more sort of an interaction based logics where. Uh, the state change happens upon the participant uh, ledger or participant state, right? So, and since the interactions are participant centric and the, the state is participant centric, these uh, sort of uh, this this machine is more or less like in, uh, intrinsically context aware. And let us understand what exactly what what do we mean by participant centric state? And I would like to just give a small context for this discussion. So when we started research at Server Labs, we uh, we were going through what is the foundational limitation 
as I discussed just few seconds before, and when we want to develop a like a, a participant-centric uh, context-aware protocol, we foundationally understood that the bottleneck is not just in the consensus uh, in terms of scalability, but it is also in the data structure. So uh, today, most of the pot protocols or web based solutions operate on an ideology called world state, where you it, it's technically like uh, you have uh, one database table and you keep on updating that database table, right? which stores the addresses or which stores the balances, the complete state information of all the participants. Whereas on the other side, uh, what we see is in interaction state machine, the participant centric state is a context aware data structure that persists value, logic, storage and trust uh, in a, in an um, as a tesseract so tesseract is a multi-dimensional data structure it, it represents a singularity of chroma value space uh, which is the outcome of a state transition in ism so every time there's some interaction which gets executed every time there's a state a transition happening in the interaction state machine there's a, the, the latest outcome is represented as tesseract and uh, Tesseract, as, as discussed, Tesseract has four dimensions. It is not just the latest information. Uh, it's not just about your logic. It's not just about your value, but it also captures the context. What led to the state change? It's not just like the input or output. It's also the context associated with this transition, right? And uh, we capture context in, um, in mainly two categories. We call that as behavioral context and uh, preferences context. So every participant, uh, whenever they interact on uh, using this interaction state machine, uh, we capture two types of context associated with it. One is a behavioral context based on the behavior of the participant. Second one is the preferences. Like as Ganesh explained, uh, you can choose what nodes to be part of your consensus set. You can choose where to execute. You can choose where to store. So so user has complete uh, control, complete ownership, or you can completely customize for every interaction. Uh, they are doing on it, which they are doing on the protocol. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rahul, for this interactive session. Now we have our uh, four, one of our two, four protocol developers uh, who will be discussing participant centric execution. So we have Manish with us. Hi, Manish. Uh, please join. Hey, Reba. Hey. Yeah. Over to you. Hey guys, so I'm Manish. I'm one of the core protocol developers here at Summer Labs, right? And we're working on the Moi protocol. And I'm sure you guys have heard from Ananta, Ganesh, and Rahul about all of the cool things about consensus and the other cool parts of the interaction state machine. Today, we're going to talk about the core of the execution itself. What happens when you have an interaction? How do you finalize it and do the calculations required to verify that it's true and you know, integral, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about execution at the participant level, right? How does it look like and what does it mean for developers coming from existing ecosystems into my so let's start with what an interaction is right so we have to we have to have that clarity before we talk about what it means to have participant centric execution because participant centric execution is all centered around an interaction right so an interaction at a high level right from a more uh, physics perspective is the unit of entanglement between two participants or between the participant and the network itself right so when you translate that to MOI, that looks something like the transactions between participants in the network and the communication between the participant and the network itself. Right? Going further into this in quantum mechanical systems, if you're familiar, the idea is that quantum mechanical systems are unpredictable and they don't have a fixed state. They're always in this flux and they can only really be resolved once you observe them. Right? This act of observance creates a resolved state in the system such that you can perceive it and often this act of observance kind of mutates the system such that you are able to perceive it. You might have heard of this concept of Schrodinger's cat, right? When a cat jumps into a box and you have poison inside it and then the box is closed, you do not know whether the cat has died or not until you open the box and check. This act of observance resolves the system and decides what state it is in. And in Moi, you can think of this concept of interaction along the same lines, this act of observance, even viewing state is an interaction in Moi, right? A unit of entanglement, that's what an interaction is, right? More at a technical perspective, right? 
being a particle centric protocol as we define the transactions between participants whether it's economic or any other kind of value transfer right or even when participants interact with the network directly for interactions like staking or governance mechanisms these are all part of interactions on the protocol itself right these the reason we have an interaction based model rather than a transaction based model right is because an interaction is designed to be able to express a large amount of complexity with a minimum amount of words right the you can abstract this idea from the concept of ants right ants are capable of building entire civilizations huge colonies but all they're able to communicate within themselves is less than 100 chemicals right these 100 unique chemicals in interactions are capable of creating a language a vocabulary that's able to comp- uh, describe so much complexity right in moi situation the fact that today we are at a testnet level we are able to already have about 30 to 40 interactions and as the network grows and evolves and the developers come and bring in more interactions and evolve the network over time the complexity that the network is able to express between participants and between part of the participant network will increase exponentially allowing the network to essentially start emulating a true digitally interactive acting society right so this is the reason we use an interaction based model because we're emulating human like interactions and we're emulating participant centered protocols this kind of behavior requires a very focused uh, way of ex- describing fu- functionality and complexity rather than a multi purpose generic format such as transactions which are mostly just meant to record generic forms of transactions right and then the form of the formation of transaction needs to be computed every time to understand what the output of the transaction is right things like value transfer and asset creation are independent interactions they're not just fields in the transaction system right a value transfer has a unique set of properties and structure that allows the protocol to recognize it as a value transfer and execute the appropriate code for it let's dive a little bit deeper into how that works right so an interaction like we talked about the reason that we have this class of interactions you can now break them up into four separate orders of interactions and the nature of this order is dependent on where this interaction is executed in respect to the code and as well as what kind of interaction uh, functionality it achieves within the protocol right so our first order of interactions right these are these are protocol baked in interaction interactions that are written right into the protocol these are executed directly in the client language so if your implementation client is go the it is interactions are executed in go code right some of the and these interactions are designed to directly manage assets participants files and logics right so some of these interactions that we have are value transfer this is your way of transferring economic value or any kind of multi dimensional value between participants and the ability to create participants is also one of these things and then creating assets unlike other ecosystems where you have to create a smart contract to define an asset or a non fungible token what you can do in moi is you can just fire an interaction called create asset add some logic to it if you want describe its mintability fungibility and its total supply and tada you now have a native asset on the protocol that can be transacted just like you would transact a pro- native native token moi right so and then you also have things like the deployment of logic and the storage of files and the accessing them and so on these are some of the small set of interactions we have which are part of the first order and these are all deal with directly managing protocol level files assets and logics right now the second order interactions now they move up one level of complexity like they move down one level of complexity and one level of safety right these native system interactions are executed in pisa which is our native execution environment right these logics which execute at the second order uh, interactions are written into the protocol client they essentially what you would call pre compiles in our ecosystem right they exist inside the ecosystem and they are the only kind of smart contract logics which are able to mutate global lattices right we've heard of participant centric lattices all over the protocol for every part spend there are little lattices as you know in in the state transitions but we also have these global state lattices that maintain global ledger systems such as the staking governance and the reputation models of the protocol right so in align with that the interactions that manipulate these states right these global states and these system level interactions they need to be executed in a safe sandbox environment right just for sake of verifiability so that comes with interaction stake or interaction the voting for governance or interaction for reputation voting all of these interactions they would fall under the second order of interactions right now the interesting one the third order of interaction right so these user defined logic interactions right these are your traditional smart contract calls right but unlike other env- execution environments in other protocols 
voice supports a range of execution environments and can continue to support new ones as innovation comes right today uh, moi is designed to support three execution environments of which one is active uh, and these are pisa made on my more of which we'll talk about in a few slides but these are what ex- used for executing user defined logic right and now as a user i go and define a deployment of a smart contract interacting with these smart contracts those would fall on the third order interactions and now the the real beauty of the system the thing that puts it all together is fourth order interactions context aware compute interactions these are essentially interactions that rather than pushing compute or vertical layer happening them off chain and settling on the main chain we take the inverse approach of triggering them on chain and then settling the execution off chain right bring the, have the provenance of the trigger on the chain but then execution can occur depending on the participant's context right within a particular set of execution nodes or within a set of nodes which are completely off the chain the ability to do this stitches it all together and that's what this this set of four interactions come together to create this interaction state machine concept this idea of turing completeness of open networks is kind of silly when you think of them directly on the smart contract level right Now let's talk a little bit about what Turing completeness is, right? To give you some background, Turing completeness is the nature of a system to simulate a Turing machine, which is a machine that is capable of any kind of general-purpose computation, right? A, a machine that's able to do any kind of math, any kind of computation, is a Turing machine, and a machine that can be ex- described, a language that can describe such a machine, would be regarded as Turing complete, right? So, our opinion. is that for the safety and the critical layer that blockchains offer for their kind uh, of execution with smart contracts in terms of immutability safety and provenance turing completeness and the unrestricted amount of computation power that they offer seems to be something that does not belong in this critical layer especially when they can open up hundreds of exploits and attack vectors right so this is the reason where we move the turing completeness to the interaction state machine which is a collection of the four orders of it interactions because things like creating is actually a first order interaction and comes with a controlled amount of power that the user can exploit right because it's directly baked into the protocol while on the other hand things like regular smart contract calls are limited and they don't allow proper turing completeness that's why we are strongly turing incomplete in our execution environments because as the safety requirement allows moi to be extremely attack resistant to all traditional uh, exploits that turing completeness opens up right so we're going to talk about these execution parameters a bit but the idea is that as a whole with these four orders of interaction moi simulates a concept of turing completeness because of its context aware compute paradigm allowing the entire network to operate as one single unified interaction state machine this single interaction state machine is a true manifestation of what a global computer was designed to be the vision on top of which web3 was built running on a single value network from the original no the protocol was managed to be What are the execution environments in Moi? Like I said, we can have multiple execution environments that Moi can support, and over time we can continue evolve them as development goes towards these directions, right? But at the core, the, the native execution environment, the one that defaults, right? This is PISA. It stands for Personalized Interaction State Automaton, right? And it's a bit of a freak machine. It kind of brings in a lot of different concepts from a lot of different ideas, but essentially. You can think about it as an analog. It's analogous to the EVM and Ethereum. It's the native protocol VM, right? But it works a little differently, right? All user-deployed logic is executed in this, and as well as second-order interactions, the ones that are systemic in nature, like uh, gov- governance, reputation. These models that need to be managed by central entities, they are also run on PISA, right? So now, what makes PISA different, right? It's an execution engine that prioritizes safety and inspectability of its bytecode right we're going to talk about this inspectability factor later we talk about deploying these logics but then the idea that the code is designed to be much more readable you try looking at solana bytecode or ethereum bytecode today kind of tough to look at what is actually being done there what exactly the logic is doing now at the bytecode level the stuff that's actually on the chain pisa makes it much more readable and understandable The way it does this is because of its higher expressibility, because it uses a register-based bytecode, not a stack-based bytecode, right? Stack-based bytecode, uh, st- sorry, stack-based bytecodes are generally less expressible because they require a lot more atomic operations, and in the large picture, it's tougher to describe what exactly they're doing. But a register-based bytecode, because it's able to describe more complexity in a single opcode, is able to be much more describable, and a more regular developer is going to be pretty satisfied by looking at the bytecode and understanding exactly what's happening on the machine. Right. We we'll talk a little bit more about how PISA works. It's 
like we said it's a register based process over here and but unlike the evm or other op, uh, virtual machines it doesn't just operate on pure integers it can also operate on compound data structures like sequences maps and user defined classes the vm recognizes structures and classes that can be defined by users and can operate on them right it has an oops based model within the vm itself but these kind of these kind of features are what we use to kind of give developers more power and control of their code but in terms of safety it has these restrictions that it cannot run unbounded loops right loops in pisa and the language it can compile from are always restricted to iteration across fixed compound objects only right and we also do not support recursions or and we have a very very strict type system right applying iterative logic on compound structures like sequences or maps can only be performed using maps filters and folding operations right the mapping operations essentially refer to transformations filters to reductions and folds into a singular reduction right it maintains the strict bindings between logic elements so every function in pisa deployed code is an independent element and then there are strict bindings of dependencies between the constants the routines the user defined classes of pisa all of these bindings are strictly maintained such that when i want to execute a particular function i only need to pull what is required for the execution the environment can be partially populated with just these elements allowing it to be much cheaper to execute a small piece of code rather than when you have a very large smart contract right pulling in the entire smart contract code into the vm is not required that's one of the core the core parts of what pisa can do right so now the pisa bytecode it can be compiled from a target language such as cocoland but it can also support languages like solidity rust and go in the future so the next vm we're going to talk about is meru this is still in development and it's something that is still working towards in terms of design especially because the web assembly ecosystem is still quite young and still growing right but I just give it give it away Meru is an execution execution environment that leverages webassembly right and all the sandboxing and portability features that come with it it uses the wasi specification that allows it to ex- exist outside of a browser and it works on the wasm bytecode spec right it works it has a very similar type system to pisa but lacks the flexibility of these logic bindings because wasm compiles the entire artifact into a single binary and that binary is now available on the protocol as a whole so just like how other protocols have to pull in the entire wasm manifest or the evm bytecode into the vm the meru has to pull in the entire wasm bytecode so we lose the flexibility of these loose logic bindings that pisa can maintain right and but it makes up for this flexibility with a much more powerful general purpose bytecode right it can compile from any general language right today all most languages that are memory safe can compile to wasm and it has a huge community of enthusiasts and developers who are actively working on both compiler and toolchain support for a variety of languages continuously evolving the ecosystem and making meru more and more attractive as an inclusion in the future and a holy crown of what we're talking about as execution environments is hanoi it's still a concept and it's not something that we're actively working towards but it is a concept that moi will support in the future especially as they're moving towards privacy enhanced computation in the future right and instead of leveraging something like zk execution proofs to prove that execution has gone a particular way we can leverage something called multi party computation so now what's multi party computation right it's a cool technology that today is used for simple cryptographic processes such as distributed key generation we use this idea for generating keys across a group of participants rather than a single node or a participant generating the secret or this key a group of people 5 10 50 the numbers are arbitrary can come together and generate this key collectively such that not a one single person has access to the full secret that they just generated each of them independently have a secret that when come when they put together is capable of being an actual secret that can unlock some encryption right Now let's apply that same logic of this kind of network based computation. Let's apply that to a general purpose framework and there we get Hanoi, right? It's general purpose multi party computation framework. It's what many people in the distributed system world are working towards and we have a kind of a cool design that allows us to leverage the things like ICS that Rahul has spoken to about everything. The fact that we already have a cluster that we created for consensus, we can now leverage that cluster for our compute itself. right the nodes where the execution needs to occur they're already part of the consensus set it's very easy to get there from go from there to the actual computation right now obviously there is complexity in describing the byte code and the kind of how how um, abstract you want to get the byte code right how low you want to go you want to go to the 
logic gate level or do you want to go down to network level interaction level at the hanoi level itself which is an interesting idea to play with right the concept that we have interactions inside interactions so this is hanoi as a execution environment is likely to usher in a new era of privacy focused computation essentially rendering zk based execution proofs unnecessary because the cost of generating zk based execution quite high right you might as well just reexecute it all over the place Hanoi, on the other hand, because every single participant in the compute cluster is independently only calculating small pieces of the compute and only accessing a small part of the data, none of them are actually capable of manipulating the entire set of data, and none of them have access to the entire set of computation range. Right? We more about Hanoi in the future. We can talk about how it works. But a good analogy for understanding how it works is its namesake, the Tower of Hanoi. It's an idea and a game that involves. three towers with disks on them and the idea is to move the disk around in such a way that they form a decreasing size of disks now you apply that concept to distributed compute and you have three spokes which essentially require, represent nodes in the multi party framework and this disk represent data right the concept of moving the data between disks is a concept of a network interaction within the multi party framework right they're mo- moving the disk around and then they're doing different kinds of operations between them and at some point one node is going to have the final answer but none of them will ever have access to any of the whole data except the final guy no one is going to have access to the entire data at, this, at any given point in time it's a good framework and a mind game to kind of think about how how now it should be designed but we will talk more about it as it gets along so now we've been talking about these logics and executing these execution environments so what is a logic let's talk about that what are logics a logic in moi represents an executable logic it's an equivalent to smart contracts the reason we go for the word logic is that it represents something more pure more simple and execute and represents something larger than just smart contracts right they may be compiled from any support for any of the supported environments we've just talked about from any supported language right but they compile into a form called a manifest more of which we'll talk about in a couple of slides right the manifest is the base unit of a logic deployment right a logic when deployed is directly attached to the participant who is deploying it right and then once deployed generates a unique logic id after which we can be used to invoke the functions very similar to a contract address but of course you need access to both the you need to know the information of both the logic id as well as the participant in which the logic id exists in order to invoke the logic right so now these logics we're talking about they can be described as have three types stateful stateless and asset based right so stateful logic are your traditional smart contracts what you're already familiar with right and they have some state associated with them that all the participants that are invoking them are bound to that state they all operate on that big same state globally Now, but a stateless logic, on the other hand, does not maintain an intrinsic state, but rather can manipulate a participant-specific state that on that the, the contract can only access when the person who has called them uh, invokes it. Right? Only a participant who has invoked the contract, only their state can be manipulated by the contract. The contract cannot manage an intrinsic state or a global state that all participants are bound. So, what's special about asset-based logics? So asset based logics are just like the other two logics they may be stateful or stateless but they are deployed alongside an asset earlier when we talked about the orders of interaction we mentioned something called create asset the way we create fungible or non fungible tokens on the protocol as native ones but sometimes it's not just about creating the asset but it's also about associating some business logic or rule set along with that asset so asset based logics allow us to deploy these assets along with some logic that allows them to be uh, invoked when this asset some interactions are performed on this asset okay so that's what asset based logic is for so writing logics in moi how does that work so moi has its own programming language called coco right and why do we need our own language right code running on open networks is subject to so many exploits and attack vectors right today the most common problems we hear about uh the EVM and Ethereum or Solana for that matter is the kind of exploits that uh people put them through right it's because these languages sometimes are not quite describable not quite safe right though so it's important that a smart contract programming language needs to be capable of performing vulnerability checks at compile time but is also very readable and clear for the both the developer as well as for auditors to come and clean like inspect the code right so coco is a programming language designed around the mo- around moi with a very deliberate opinionated and safe language model what i mean by that is that every decision you make in coco every line of code 
has a very clear purpose of what it does and it's very very difficult for a developer to make a mistake that it didn't intend to make right every piece of like every line in coco is heavily described and every action represents a very strong opinion of what exactly happened there's very little ambiguity in a single line of coco right so in and towards safety this like we talked about pisa coco doesn't support unbounded loops or recursions and minimizes the amount of variable mutability in an effort towards the safety right coco will be directly able to compile to pisa statefully and will eventually be able to compile to mail on hanoi as well deploying logics we talked about manifest when we talked about the way logics work earlier right so manifest like i said are a unit of deployment for logics right all execution environments expect it as the logic resource the minimum amount of uh, structure that it expects as a common factor so that it can compile and run this code right cocolang directly compiles into a manifest file when compiling for the pisa target and will do so for mail on hanoi as well manifest serve the purpose of being a descriptor for the logic and its actual bytecode but and its elements of course but also describes the interface for interacting with them in the form of an abi traditionally smart contracts developers are used to downloading the abi for the logic and then attaching that as part of their smart their logic application and then having to use that abi to generate the kind of transactions required to talk to that logic but the point you the abi is part of the chain itself so all you need to do is look up this abi or this manifest and then use this abi and this interface to directly talk to the contract right so invoking functions on my does not require this uh, abi as i said to generate appropriate call data because the calling interfaces are available on chain can be verified and viewed at any point these manifest files can be described using any of the supported encoding schemes such as json yaml and polo more of which pankaj will talk about in his talk upgrading the logic holy grail people keep talking about logics being upgradable and moving towards that, uh, that uh, era of logics being upgradable because that's just this way developers are used to working in the real world and blockchains don't support this kind of behavior and for good reason logics and moi are intrinsically immutable but as they should be though but this is only because we need to provide the safety and interface guarantees expected of smart contracts you can't have developers deploying a smart contract application being built on the smart contract and then the develop original developer changing the smart contract into something entirely different right so moi allows this kind of upgradeability but it works in a very interesting and intelligent way right it has a namespace uh, manager within the protocol and a domain name service basically that points to a specific logic right now this domain name provides no guarantee of immutability though, and can be modified at any point to uh, point to a different logic id right it's a contract between the names of provider and the logic id to make sure that they are consistent but as an application you can call the namespace hoping that the application provider is successfully always pointing to the latest version safely or you can disregard that and directly talk to the contract yourself right both are allowed right so the way we support this idea of versioning the logic now in terms of upgradeability how does that work so now we have the namespace manager clearly it's going to be able to point to different logics great but how do we migrate logic how do we evolve and version right so migrating logic states involves sealing the original logic right and then migrating its entire state into new logic right so let's say you have a contract a and now contract b is a second contract that you've done as an upgrade to the contract a now contract a state can be migrated to contract b under the condition that contract b state is a superset of contract a we can which we can define as the idea that you maintain the original state but i've only grown it and i've not shrunk any of the state metrics that are available in the original contract right so once this migration is possible and once now that it's once it's been done the original contract the contract a gets sealed it can no longer be mutated it's still available for views but now goes it goes into the state called a sealed contract such that no one can actually mutate its state it now is locked and by default the logic names that point to it will upgrade to this new uh, logic that has been deployed as its migrated state right this allows people to maintain the provenance truth of the original contract but now upgrade to a new version of the contract without any hassle to the application right now this namespace service and this ability to migrate logic states collectively allow moi to emulate logic upgrade in a useful way so this is a high level just of how logics work in moi and that's it from my side guys thank you
so that was manish right uh, we he explained to us about how certain things have been designed but uh, to take the session further we have uh, another port port protocol developer sai prashant he will be talking about decentralization and sustainability and how we have designed them in moix so hi hi everyone this is sai uh, today i will be uh, i'm here to discuss about decentralization and sustainability like how we are achieving that in moix so um so like the tech giants like google uh, amazon uh, apple microsoft and meta like were built on the top uh, open source that was enabled by the web 1 which is like static pages which is permissionless so everything is good right there so and then uh, like but they have created something like a world gardens uh, to uh, like they have like, they have built like a world gardens ecosystem uh, to enable social connection and content creation but like yeah these world gardens are very successful because they can make things easy to do uh, and also easy to easy to do or easy to access but they are permission and anonymous uh, that regulate what you can do on the, like they also get benefited by exchanging the information that you have so for the very reason uh, web3 have a paradigm shift features uh, so which is what which is what value exchange uh, with my it is not just economic uh, but also uh, like it is not just economic or information exchange but it is also uh, the actual value that you have in real life and also uh, the paradigm shifting feature in uh, in web3 and also in my is self sovereignty for your identity information so so let's see uh, like what what is value exchange here so so basically in current networks if you ask me uh like they have a smart contracts where your business logic will be running but uh, this smart contracts are very great that uh, so so they are like they are transparent and also like programmatically and transparently exchange values so here the value can be your assets or it can be your currency or any uh, any property that you have with each other without requiring uh, any brokers or intermediaries in between so but currently uh, the what is the problem is that currently these interactions are not strongly or uh, the va- these interactions or the value that is derived from the interactions are not strongly bonded to the uh, participant meaning so it is not like a value so it is it's not like a balance meaning so you need another intermediary something like a smart something like a smart contract address or smart contract thing uh, to uh to uh, to access that particular value or to access that particular uh, own like to to prove that you own that like you really own that particular uh, value that got generated you really need a smart contract intermediary but with my uh with my it's it's very natively connected with the net uh, participant uh, so it is like it, like how you access the balance so it is very uh, like it is that easy, i mean Uh, it is natively strong, very strongly bonded to the participant, so that uh, without any intermediaries, or you don't need to actually keep the particular address or some, anything to access the value. So, so it's it's like saying uh, so balance uh, meaning how we can put this. So in other networks or in other protocols, there is a network, and then there is a participant. Meaning network is built, and then participant came into picture. But big man. participant first which is he, where he is centric and then network was built around him so that's how my can uh, my is like i would say monopoly in value exchanges uh, and then so uh, like we have a, a completely new uh, technology called flux which is a context randomizer uh, which will uh, which will also help in like achieving the decentralization in the network so you, you might got it by now from the rafel's presentation so that Uh, for every user there will be context where context nodes are like uh, comprised of uh, net, uh, like context network nodes are comprised of behavior nodes user nodes that he want and also the random nodes so as he already explained what is co- behavior nodes i'm just skipping it so uh, so like let's come to random nodes because this is where the actual re- actual decentralization actually happens so this flux technology 
uh, is responsible for providing the random nodes across the network. So when when ICS come to uh, when ICS got started, so uh, like the Krama engine, which is responsible for ICS, is uh, going to talk with this flux where to to have the random node pool where to get some set of random nodes. And also, like uh, it's not like it's fixed random set. Uh, it's fixed set of random nodes, but uh, like every time it gets the reset, and then uh, there is a mechanism in the in the network. Like there is a random walk where you will go and set like to fill up this particular random. So every time uh, it's stipulated time of it's stipulated time, this got reset, and then it's it's got uh, filled up. So this is also help this uh, this technology, the flux. It will also help in. Uh, uh, the growth of the participant context so that it's like how you can see this in real life is so you went into some event and then you you network with some people so that in any future in future if you got any uh, any connection you will be reminding of this guy so that yeah the, that guy i have met in that event who can help in this particular context that might be so you can think like so these random nodes can be some guys that we have met in the uh, event and then who can help is in who can help in another context so, uh, so you can see like everywhere you can actually connecting where you don't have any connection with him before, but after interaction has done, who's a random node, who's a random guy. So you, this where the decentralization comes into uh, decentralization come into picture. So, like we are not sticking to just the behavior nodes, like not every time same nodes. Uh, so it's not sticking to the behavior nodes, but also the random. Uh, so. I mean, what I, what I meant to say is like it's not just the behavior node that every time in the ICS to achieve the ICS, uh, I mean the interaction capability. So that's how Flux will help us. So another uh, like another uh, like feature that Web3 has introduced, yeah, uh, the cell, uh, the self sovereignty. If you observe. Our digital and physical lives are increasingly linked to our apps, services, and devices we use to access a rich set of experiences that are made up of uh, everything we say or we do or in your life. Currently, our identity and all our digital interactions are owned and controlled by other human organizations or applications, meaning you have no control over how it is uh, used on the preserve. As a result, security code could be deprioritized. So, for the very reason, uh, Moi, uh, like Moi introduced a uh, uh, technology called Moi ID, so uh, to enable self sovereignty for the participant in the network. So, uh, like to make it simple, Moi ID is a uh, like it, it's comprises of personalized data store and also it's a DID. So, how I can easily tell this is. Um, uh, okay, we can say this as like my it is this part uh, self sovereignty using my ID, which is a DID uh, that de emphasizes the centralized storage of user information, uh, thereby like data where every interaction is unable to zero knowledge cryptography. So, so this also bolsters uh, the individuals to control their data, meaning it forces to control the data so there is no way that uh, like the, the applications to we have given access to have a control of so so maybe we can see this in a real life example so yeah so uh, we have implemented the DID implementation for my validator onboarding the ecosystem so you so some of the validators have, might might have already experienced this so they will be uh, so to make it easy I will just explain the flow so issuer here is nothing but the IOMI, uh, which is the which is like an identity network that empowers human with my ID, which is powered by ZK, uh, zero knowledge proofs. So here, user will get a my ID. So they they have verified their KYC, or if it is the institution, they have verified their KYB. So what uh, IOMI will actually do, technically speaking, is here in this context, this the IOMI is the issuer where. Uh, the issuer will issue the credential in the tamper evident and uh, I would say privacy respecting manner which is which can be verified by the verifier tomorrow or uh, to establish a trust or grant access to the particular uh, to like 
to to the particular resource i would say so so whenever iomi issues this particular uh, verifiable credentials which will tell that whether this guy is kyc verified or not without revealing anything to the verifier so this verifier here is nothing but the my pod which is the uh, which is which is like a cross platform executable binary that provides all the my services <laughs> so what this verifier will actually do is uh, so it will talk to the uh, it will talk to the the uh, the did resolvers uh, where uh, to access this particular verifiable credential that tells that i am kyc verified Mean so again, so there is no way you can get to the actual KYC details because it's zero knowledge proof. So, so the only thing that we are seeing right there, and the only the proof, I mean the content that really exists there is uh, the signed data by the issuer to that particular user, which can be verified without without any uh, without any interaction between them. So, so nothing has been lost. So meaning. Uh, so it's like there is no way of data breaches because there is a saying right if there is no data there there is nothing to the uh, theft so that's how we can put it and then yeah that's about decentralization in mind uh so now let's talk about sustainability in mind to make it easy uh we have broken down the sustainability like we we follow three p strategy uh, uh we have broken down the sustainability in in uh, into three p's meaning uh people in social angle uh, planet in an environmental angle or dimension profits in economic angle so let's see how uh, sustainability achieved in people meaning in a social dimension or social angle so my promise is that transfer uh, so every interaction that you do are transparent and publicly communicated information which cannot be tampered that way so uh, there is no i mean there is no way you can say tomorrow that i haven't i haven't done that interaction yet so that's how it is uh, helpful for the people and also verifiable records in provenance of the same can help de decipher the truth meaning uh, so uh, like as i said i i just explained so tomorrow you can just not at, you cannot say that like i haven't done this interaction because it's already right there which cannot be tampered which cannot be tampered or which can be Uh, like everything has been uh, locked. I mean, uh, there is a provenance that you have not that for that particular interaction. And also, uh, uh, unless other other protocols or networks, the entry is very cheap, very simple, and very flexible. Meaning, so uh, okay, maybe I will come into uh, that point when I am explaining other things. But uh, so, and also there is no uh, discrimination from from the big players. Meaning, so if you see some of the networks, uh, I can't name them, but uh, some of the networks where there is only uh, there is like multiple people who are like uh, where every every transaction that comes into network will land on that particular node. Uh, like if you land on a particular, only they can only get rewarded. But with my, it is no more the case because. we have a uh, uh, intelligent load balancer which can handle these particular things which i will explain further uh, more about it so how sustainability is achieved in environmentally so uh, like everyone i mean maybe you know that uh, so we are no more we are not using a proof of work consensus to achieve uh, to, to achieve the finality so we have come up with our own uh, consensus mechanism which rahul and uh, like Ganesh and Ananta have been described earlier, but uh, that is what is what context-based consensus. So uh, there is not uh, there is like as there is no proof of work. Like uh, you don't really need that much energy to mine any transactions that or verify any transactions that is there. So not only that, uh, like we as we are saying that uh, our motto is to make every uh, every participant happy in every interaction. So as every like as every interaction is human-like. that make people happy so the planet will be happy uh, like that's how we can say and also uh, the real reason of including the cryptography also in the reply planet uh, i mean this environmental thing is because uh, you see in in the consensus mechanism there will be so much of verifications so much of aggregations so much of uh, i would say uh, proof generation that will happen so mudra is a cryptography module uh, in the mind 
uh, takes very less storage and very very less time for proof generations or verifications. So uh, to precise, uh, we will we are using for signature generations and proof uh, for signature generations and aggregations. We are using BLS 12381, where like you know 12 is a uh, 12 degree polynomial and 381 is uh, just a uh, is a bits that covers when we generate a signatures. And also we use uh, so uh, we have been saying that every interactions is zero knowledge authenticated or zero knowledge uh, interacted. So so how we are different. Uh, like you know that people have been using zero knowledge, but so we are not just using GK snarks. I mean, not zero knowledge implementation. We are using a zero knowledge snarks with Halo implementation. Meaning, so if you see any other, uh, in, uh, if you see any other network that implements zero knowledge uh, authentication, so they will be using a trusted party to generate a public parameters. So uh, that's where the signature is already gone because you are depending upon a trusted party uh, to get the parameter for the proof uh, for the proof generation. So tomorrow, if they got to know your random secretness, how you have generated the particular public parameters for your interaction, uh, there is a chance that they can generate a false proof uh, and then claim that you are me, uh, me as you. So. So we have come up with, a, I mean, meaning we have been using a Halo implementation to generate a, a public parameters for this particular proof generations where every every time uh, it is very dynamic whenever you generate any proof. So that's how we overcome with this. <laughs> and then we, uh, and then how sustainability we are achieving in economic dimension or angle. So for this particular, uh, Mainly for this particular thing, as I have explained in sustainability in people dimension or uh, social dimension, we have come up with a technology called Fulcrum. It's an intelligent load balancer for peer to peer based, uh, like peer to peer networks, which is again based on the context. So, uh, like as I had explained in the previous example, so every time uh, if you have stake, lot of, st uh, if you have put lot of stake, so there is a chance that you are any transaction that is there in the network will land on your transaction zone and only you will be getting rewarded. So, but Bitcoin, uh, it's no more the chance, uh, no more the case because we have a, uh, we have an intelligent consent, uh, in intelligent load balancer, which will do this job. Meaning if your node is like sitting idle because it's up and down for some time so that, so that it won't, it, it's not up to take that particular transaction. So it has the intelligence that uh, this guy is not properly getting rewarded as others, so it it can it can divert the it can uh, divert the transaction that comes or interaction that comes into that particular node, so that 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 will also get uh, incentivized or rewarded. So and also the beautiful thing that uh, that in the mines you don't really need a sophisticated hub hardware, especially meaning uh, like even a Raspberry Pi can also be part of your network. So that it just just yeah just plug it your Raspberry Pi to your bedroom plug and then yeah so you will be rewarded when you are in sleep so that's what anyone expects uh, uh, which is we were doing in the works right so that's how uh, like in the proper in the uh, in the profit or economical angle Moi can help you sustain uh, in future uh, with that uh, like I would like to conclude that. Uh, uh, I would like to conclude the decentralizing sustainability and more, uh, and then uh, to Pankas for interoperability, how we achieve it. Thank you. And we are back. Thank you so much, Sai, for your session. Now we have another uh, protocol developer with us. His name is Pankaj, and he'll be discussing how we manage data ma management and interoperability in MOI. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Pankaj Nayak. I work here as a core protocol developer at Server Labs, and today I'm going to cover about uh, data management and interoperability in MoI. So, uh, so, so there are three key aspects in MoI system when it comes to uh, data management. The first is uh, Agora. So, Agora is a context-aware block exchange uh, protocol. Now, what Agora means is in ancient Greece, uh, an open space 
uh, which is used for assembly and marketplace that is you know we in the ancient time people used to call it agora you know it's a marketplace and whatever commodities we find in a marketplace especially in moy all of them have a context now the second thing second topic is polo so polo stands for prefix ordered lookup offset now uh, polo is a encoding scheme which is conceptualized uh, because of the shortcoming of protocol buffers uh, you know such as its inability to uh, generate deterministic serialization output and and when we are building a cryptographic uh, blockchain applications where security is of you know very uh, utmost importance we have to have a solution where when we convert a in memory data structures to the wire format it has to be in a you know canonical serialization format we should be able to you know exactly convert in memory data structures into the wire format so that's why we have you know uh, built our in house uh, polo polo protocol which is an in encoding uh, uh, protocol then we have uh, dhruva so dhruva is a multi level uh, database layer to persist the data in our network now we'll see you know going further in the slides that you know why there was a need for you know uh, developing these modules and these, these pieces uh, you know for moi so why exactly why exactly do we need agora you know so uh, when you know we already have these solutions like uh, bitswap bitswap is being used by ipfs which also provides you the capability to have you know block exchange uh, but if you see the how bitswap work is the the fundamental problem is that whenever a content comes into the network a peer whoever whoever, whoever is the peer who generates that content and adds an entry in a dsk table that this content uh, this hash i am having so these entries it creates but if you see the moi protocol the moi protocol is designed in such a way that when the network is scales its performance increases right so you know going further down the line you know the network is going to have you know millions and billions of transaction and if we go by the model how bitswap work we cannot create those many entries uh, you know in a dst table because it will consume a huge amount of storage right so that's why we have come up with agora which which is a context aware uh, protocol it means that whenever a data is generated in a network it is having some kind of a context now when we say context what is this context so this context tells us that which all node exactly have this data and, and the fetcher you know in the fetcher can directly go and talk to that particular guy and you know get the data now and uh, now if you see moi moi usually operate uh, you know operates in a very highly confident environment and and we needed a way to handle the situation gracefully and in and in, in in a very efficient manner so just to give you an example you know like if you compare with other blockchains and you know, and, and and the moi protocol there is a concept of uh, local finality and global truth so what i mean by that you know like let's say there are two transactions are happening a transaction between a and b and a c and d in moi both of the transaction can happen concurrently in a parallel fa fashion now you imagine a situation where you have you know lakhs of nodes and there is a transaction happening between a and b now we achieve the finality the proof that this transaction happen these you know fi finality the proof that the transaction happen is achieved by few subset of these nodes but the ultimate proof that the transaction happened has to be propagated in the entire network now when this information is propagated in the entire network the, the you know this information has some context and this context gives you gives you the ability to exactly go and ask the person who is having this data now if you imagine you may imagine a situation where 1 lakh people are trying to get this information get this this proof there could be a possibility that some of the guys you know who is who is serving this data might be getting lot of requests to you know give that give that data so in this this kind of a situation uh, you know we have built a small intelligent layer that the the people who have already served the block or the data to other guys when they are busy they give a context that who all else in the network could have this data so this is how you know agora works 
uh, and, and this was very much required because of the special use cases of uh, our mod. Uh, now, uh, now I'll go to the next slide and uh, and and we'll see you know why there was a requirement to you know develop protocol Apollo at at the first place. Thank you so much, Pankaj. And with this, uh, we conclude today's session. So today was day two of ACOM, and uh, the focus for today was technology and engineering. Tomorrow we will be talking about the business side of things, how uh, we implement uh, uh, Prama and by extension Moi, uh, how our adopters are leveraging this, and how other people who are interested in using them for their business solution. Can be uh, can use power of power of Moi to take this to next level. Thank you so much. Uh, we will connect tomorrow at 5 p.m. IST.